Thank you so much, and I welcome you all to the uh, Young Ophthalmologist Society of India session, the YOSI session uh, in the Cake and Pie Expo. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the whole team of MediaWise, Matt, and his wonderful team, Ruchi, for you know organizing everything and giving us this opportunity. And I would invite Dr. Apurva Ayachit, who is a consultant at uh, Vitoretna Consultant at MM Joshi Eye Hospital. Uh, and the, he, she takes care of the academic activities uh, in UC as well. Uh, she'll, I'll invite her to introduce the session for all of us. She has formulated all the questions, so she's the best person to tell us about this session. So thank you, Divakant. Uh, it's an honor, absolute honor, to be moderating this session uh, with Divakant. Uh, I'm happy that UC is one of the hosts for this, and thank you, Cake and Pie, for having this wonderful uh, webinar. So I look forward to interacting with all of you. We have uh, about 10 panelists from all over the world. So we decided to have this uh, session uh, about education, clinical training, and surgical training, along with some practice-related questions for young ophthalmologists in specific. So we've been battling with this pandemic for the last uh, year or so, and it has been hard on residents, residents uh, training, uh, surgical training, and also young ophthalmologists just out of residency in the first five years of their practice. So we decided to formulate these questions uh, uh, pertaining to this kind of uh, scenario for young ophthalmologists. And uh, I hope all the questions are going to cover most of our uh, concerns. Um, this panel discussion is going to be very, very interesting because we've ha we'll be having perspectives from young ophthalmologists from all over the world. So uh, Divakant, back to you. Yeah. Great. So uh, now I'll invite Dr. Digvijay Singh, who is the uh, director of Nobel Eye Care Hospital in uh, Gurgaon, India. And he also heads the Department of Ophthalmology at Narayana Super Speciality Hospital. And more importantly for this meeting, he is the president of uh, the Young Ophthalmologist Society of India. So give us the opening remark and then we'll proceed with the panel. Thank you, Devakant. And it's indeed a pleasure to be having this session and to be able to interact with all of you. And I thank all the speakers for taking out their time from their busy schedules for you know participating in this UOC session. We are really eagerly looking forward uh, you know, to hearing all your opinions and thoughts about these questions. And this is something that has affected all of us in the young ophthalmologists age group, the residents, the fellows, and even in practice. So that's why we begin with what is more pertaining to us, which is the education portion, as well as the training portion. And uh, yes, I you know declare this session open and I look forward to interacting with everyone. And Devakant, over to you and all the best. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so the first segment that we have is uh, the education or the clinical aspect of the training. And uh, a lot of us had to switch over to, initially there was a uh, uh, complete stoppage of the academics that was going on and all of us picked up with the online platforms and started uh, utilizing them. Uh, so we really need to understand how these webinars uh, have affected academics and, uh, you know, and how uh, whether it is difficult to concentrate for uh, residents whether it has become more interesting or easy or more accessible and how can we overall uh, enhance this uh, teaching experience through the online platforms uh, for this uh, i want to have the opinions from a lot of our panelists today and first i would invite dr honda uh, he is a vitroretna surgeon at changung memorial hospital in Linko, taiwan and he's also the founding member of the Young Ophthalmologist Committee in the Taiwan Ophthalmic Society. So, Dr. Honda, over to you. Okay, hey, thank you, uh, Diva Kent. Um, it's a wonderful ex um, chance for me and for all of us to um, come here together online and discuss about all the um, um, educational um, um, changes uh, during the COVID um, era. So, um, for Taiwan, we just recently entered a, lo a semi-lockdown uh, in the past one month. So it's a relatively short period uh, compared to some other countries. But um, for the past one year, we have been uh, adopting several um, measurements um, to cope with the possible uh, lockdown scenario. So we have increased our online uh, web uh, on online meetings, morning meetings, 
and, and the feedbacks from the residents are quite positive. So for one thing is that they have uh, less clinical duties, so they don't have to rush to the operation rooms or to rush to the clinics, so they can have a full experience on participating all the uh, morning meetings. And um, it's good because we have some polling systems on the Zoom um, application. So uh, we try to uh, add more this, of this function into our morning meeting session. So to make sure that we can get the uh, instant feedback from the residents and to make sure that they're still awake during the whole process. Yeah, it's easy to fall asleep in the early, uh, early meetings uh, when you, maybe some of them are still in bed. So uh, it's a good, very good function to have a poll uh, from time to time on the morning meeting sessions. And it's also good that, um, because uh, previously, if you want to extend more discussion, um, you have to ask um, these questions privately after the morning meetings. But usually we don't have that much uh, uh, leisure time to do uh, these discussions. But now because they don't have much clinical cases, so I found that some more active residents, they will uh, message me after um, the morning meetings and discuss further about the cases. So I think this is a very good um, uh, um, practice for all the young uh, residents because um, in the past, maybe the consultants, they don't have much time to answer all these questions and discuss with you uh, individually. But uh, at this period, it's a good, if you're active, you can al always get more from these uh, senior um, uh, doctors. So be active. I think that's uh, still a very important uh, key point uh, under this uh, uh, COVID uh, scenario. And another thing is that uh, due to this um, pandemic, we have been cooperating with uh, other hospitals in, um, in Malaysia and also um, in Japan. So we have a joint uh, resident day. So in the past, we just held, hold a resident day um, from our domestic hospitals, but now we can uh, collaborate with uh, international uh, hospitals and uh, say for um, Japan, we collaborate with the Tokyo uh, Medical and Dental University where uh, Professor uh, Ono Matsui uh, is working now and uh, we have a great resident day with their residents. So it's uh, more stressful for our residents but more interesting and competitive. So they definitely learn a lot from these experiences. So I think uh, these uh, webinars are very good opportunities despite we cannot meet in person, but we can always get more from these new technologies. So these are my small, uh, some of my opinions. And um, so now I op open the discussion to the floor and back to uh, our host. Thank you. Wonderful inputs, uh, Dr. Chow. And uh, so polling is a wonderful feature that can be utilized to engage our residents. And really an interesting point where we can all uh, different medical colleges and hospitals can collaborate and uh, hold joint sessions. Wonderful inputs. Now I would invite uh, our vice president uh, of the Young Ophthalmologist Society of India, Dr. Sonal Kalia, who is also a faculty at the SMS uh, Jaipur, SMS Medical College Jaipur. Uh, Dr. Sonal, your inputs on this uh, new way of teaching in this COVID era. A very good uh, afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much, Devakant, for the kind introduction. And thank you to uh, Cake and Pie Media team for organizing this wonderful platform for a common discussion among young ophthalmologists of our age group who can you know, really bring forward these points uh, about online teaching and, and other aspects that we are going to discuss today. So uh, before coming here, I, I tried to discuss these points over with my residents and the other faculty. And um, I, I came to you know uh, a conclusion that uh, ev like every te new technology that that comes in there are every everything comes in with its own merits and demerits so this this whole thing has had a melange of responses i should say so uh, like there are some residents who are very very uh, apprehensive to ask uh, questions online because they fear that you know others will get to listen to their question and maybe that question is stupid whereas in an offline platform they could always ask, at the end of the class you know just follow the teacher and and ask the question personally 
So this was one response that I got. And then a response that I got was that uh, they could always, uh, you know, uh, have a, a demonstration of certain techniques when the teacher was right in front of them in the uh, in the classroom. And the warmth, of course, cannot be uh, replaced. Uh, but in the in the uh, offline platform, they were also saying that, you know, when the teachers are the panel of entire quorum of teachers is sitting right in front of you. So your attentiveness uh, definitely goes up a volume when, you know, the head of the department and everybody is looking at you. And here at home, you're in a relaxed environment. You have the option of switching off your uh, video and staying mute. And, you know, suddenly a call comes or something. And, you know, your uh, even if your screen is showing something on Facebook, your attention does get diverted for a second or so. Though uh, being at home gives them a chance to also sometimes, you know, be really stress-free rather than the stressful uh, formal environment that a, a class has. They were also uh, trying to tell me that some of them uh, who were having refractive errors and all, they developed a lot of screen fatigue after not just classes, but uh, uh, watching the number of webinars that have been uh, cropping up. They also told me, and I also felt that a lot of residents used to message me that we have our COVID duties going on. See, the ophthalmology classes that are being organized in the webinars are the only way in which we are in contact with ophthalmology and really feeling like a resident of ophthalmology. Because in a government center, in, in most of the government centers in, uh, I should say, North India, not just SMS Jaipur, uh, all the residents have been uh, utilized uh, in the workforce for COVID and later for MUCR also. So they have. Uh, lost quite a lot of their time uh, away from the wards of pure ophthalmology, I should say. So that was one way of being connected to the subject. And during all those uh, classes, uh, they could, uh, you know, in a way have some time uh, away from the, the stress of uh, COVID, I should say. But uh, yes, overall, I think uh, it's, a, it's a mixed response that I could uh, glean from the responses that I got in my department and from the teachers. Some people like initially it was a peak of uh, responses it's uh, like uh, like everything in life there's a crescendo and then there's a loss of interest so like online platforms initially everybody wanted to learn about the technology and everyone was attentive and later on the interest starts slowing down because they have this option of having all those meetings recorded and they can always watch it later but that later does it ever come for me, I have tried to see some topics and then I'm like, I'm really interested. Oh, yeah, but it's going to be recorded. I'll watch it later. And then that later doesn't come because there's some new webinar that comes in and, you know, you are involved in it. But that's maybe just for me and others are maybe much more, uh, I should say, prompt and uh, disciplined. Sometimes one does, uh, you know, fall off the wagon that way also. But then, yes, it's, it's definitely a way in which we have all been able to continue ophthalmology training and teaching when residents are busy and uh, uh, they do appreciate many, many aspects of it. Uh, after the initial lag of the technology in which, you know, uh, some of the senior teachers were not able to understand how to, you know, really log into Zoom and all. After all those hurdles have been crossed, I think it's a very good uh, uh, way to, you know, continue our education. So thank you so much for this question, Apurva and Devakan both. Thank you so much, Dr. Sonal. And of course, uh, as you have uh, rightly pointed out, there are a lot of limitations uh, and uh, you know, hassles that come with uh, an online platform and hopefully we'll be able to overcome them and uh, soon. So next, uh, may I invite... Fantastic uh, answer, Dr. Sona. <laughs> so <laughs> next, may I invite uh, Dr. Chi Wai. He is a consultant uh, retina surgeon at the Singapore National Eye Centre and he also chairs the uh, Singapore Society of Ophthalmology, your chapter. Over to you, Dr. Chi Wai. Hi, thank you, Divakan. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this very interesting conversation. Uh, I agree with many of the points that Dr. Uh, Sonal and Dr. Hongda have uh, already mentioned. And I think that um, we all have to agree that webinars have played a very critical role, especially in the initial parts of the pandemic, when uh, I guess we none of us could have met up face to face for any physical teaching sessions. And in a way, he has uh, facilitated greater attendance in teaching sessions uh, where in the past it might have been uh, not so possible because of differences in clinical placement. But uh, even though we have seen a sharp increase in attendance across the board for teaching sessions, I think participation levels have not increased and perhaps even decreased. And uh, the reason for this, as uh, uh, the speakers have already mentioned, is the lack of a physical classroom environment, it makes it difficult because there's, there's so many, uh, there's a whole range of distractions working against a fully involved learning when you're not in a physical classroom. 
uh, like if you are listening in the car or when you're still on the bed. So there's a definite difference between that and a physical classroom. And it's also difficult to measure engagement levels because the, the teacher, I'm sure all of you would have experienced, if, if the videos are not on, uh, not on for most of the learners, you can't even see uh, whether they are there, you're just talking to your computer, you're not sure whether people are listening, whether they are uh, able to understand, you can't pick up any visual cues from the learners, and you can't calibrate the speed of your teaching to match their level of understanding. So I think, uh, as uh, some of the speakers have mentioned, for webinars to be truly effective, there needs to be quite liberal use of learning checkpoints within the webinar, such as uh, using quizzes, polls, uh, multiple choice questions, you sprinkle them in the session to keep the learners engaged. And at the same time, you can assess the effectiveness of your teaching. Uh, also, leaving a, enough time for Q&A is a good way for learners to catch up on points they may have missed or had difficulty understanding. And uh, also allows uh, learners who are not so uh, maybe forthcoming to ask questions. Uh, they could type their questions in the, the Q&A box uh, that many of these uh, webinar platforms have, like Zoom, you have you have there as well. So uh, I guess we to make them more effective, the, the key is to encourage the learners to make use of these uh, Q&A. Uh, uh, you basically just type in the questions, you can ask questions, uh, answer MCQs during the webinars to, to kind of uh, uh, enhance their learning experience. So this is how I feel that uh, in the future, perhaps a new model of learning should, should be using some of these techniques. Yeah, thank you, Divaka. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, uh, very rightly pointed out that uh, it's really important to you know engage the audience and keep them engaged all throughout. And wonderful uh, checkpoints that you've pointed out. So next, may I invite Dr. Ashrafal Haq, uh, who is a faco refractive surgeon from Bangladesh and he heads the Bangladesh Young Ophthalmologist Society. Dr. Ashrafal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Devakant, and thank you, Young Ophthalmologist Society of India for inviting me and thank you medium for the wonderful cake and pie expo the thing is that for the new era this is pandemic we are scared we cannot go out but every situation has a new opportunity what is that in this pandemic taught us the webinar online classes so that the classroom and the classroom teaching and the webinar teaching these are not different rather than i would like to say that the webinar teaching or online teaching is better because what is that number one is that you can arrange lots of faculties, lots of teachers. When the, before the pandemic, we arrange the classes. So there are certain teachers, they had to uh, come to the work classroom and deliver the lectures. But now what is they doing? We are arranging different topics and lectures. Some foreign faculties and foreign uh, specialists are joining and deliver their lecture, which is, which is very much effective for the residents and the trainees. This is number one. And number two is that, you can arrange it, not necessarily you have to arrange it by 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. in certain time. You can arrange it at night. So uh, the other speaker would say that they have some little bit comfortability. The one different thing is that, that in webinar, you need to monitor about the students, about the resident, that you know the monitoring is for kindergarten and the playgroup students, not for us who are willing to learn. Because the webinar is such a thing that every resource is there. You need to pick what you, need to take. That is the good part of the webinar. And I think that after the pandemic, webinar won't stop. It will continue. Maybe the hybrid, the new term will continue. And another thing is that the good part is that, yeah, we have little bit uh, tech problem for the, I'm uh, talking that our generation, we are always the tech friendly. We have a little bit problem with the seniors, but this pandemic has the very good reason and very, they've also taught the seniors to use the Zoom and other platform and other things. So they are also tech friendly also. So this is also the plus point. So my point is that I am very much agreed with the other speakers that this webinar and online teaching is very much effective. And this is obviously a little bit has more advantage than the classroom, but both we need to continue in future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashton. And yes, very true that a uh, lot of us have connected uh, because of this uh, revolution, this uh, Zoom revolution that we had. So it's 
a lot of us were able to collaborate and hold meetings. So it's a wonderful point that you made. Uh, next, uh, last but not the least, I have uh, Dr. Mays. Uh, she is a Jordanian board certified ophthalmologist, and she has also founded Yojo, that is the Young Ophthalmologist of Jordan. Jordan. So Dr. Mays, over to you. Good morning, Vivek. Good morning, everybody from Amman. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, well, I'll be. I think I agree with uh, most of what everybody said uh, about the um, webinars because uh, personally I was skeptical when it first came out because I don't really enjoy being um, in front of a screen for a long time. But um, when I just uh, realized that it's a great opportunity for me, even as an ophthalmologist and as the residents as well, uh, to um, get uh, the experience from worldwide resident, uh, residents or even uh, world-renowned ophthalmologists uh, and be in their master classes. Um, I believe uh, webinars brought the world together uh, in a way that we wouldn't have um, seen if it weren't for the pandemic. Um, another thing that we did in Jordan is that we tried to, um, you know, gather the experiences of ophthalmologists from different institutions um, where there is uh, an institution where we don't have maybe an oculoplastic surgeon, we try to um, make that oculoplastic surgeon give master class for all the residents for board uh, reviews as well. That wasn't there before. Um, so you can gather more experiences from all around when you have um, this webinar or virtual setting, let's say. Um, that's something that we didn't have or we couldn't attain before the uh, pandemic. Uh, one thing that I don't like about webinars is when they are long. I believe that our attention span would just waver past 90 minutes or so. And we experienced some webinars that went on for three hours. And I don't believe you can stay put for three hours and just listen and take on all that information. Um, incorporating polls, questions, as well as Zoom rooms are really great. Uh, we try to... Um, uh, try to couple or pair um, residents together or resident with a mentor in a room and they can ask them right away what they want or question that they have. That's really great. Um, also, another thing is that uh, incorporating a lot of surgical videos, a lot of um, things that are really clinical in your uh, presentation would attract the attention of um, the resident as well as any of the attendees. So um, keep it short or concise, uh, um, try to be very interactive and avoid self-promotion. We have seen a lot of self-promotion on those webinars where you just try to uh, put on a really good um, webinar and then the uh, speaker doesn't really go into the point. They're talking a lot about themselves and stuff like that. And I believe that would just um, uh, make you lose your audience and uh, lose their attention. So, um, but I believe it's a positive thing. And I believe the hybrid concept is going to continue after uh, the pandemic. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. yeah. Apurva, any comments from you? Yeah, so uh, uh, wonderful answers, everybody. I that what's wonderful is that there is very little overlap between between your perspectives. So it's each of you has so many fresh perspectives that makes every one of us think. So one thing I noticed about webinars was that there's this burst of creativity. So many people have had so many webinars about such diverse topics. It's almost as if you're thinking about what to what webinar to have next. So in that quest, I think there's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of um, allied topics uh, to talk about. As in, uh, we've had uh, webinars about finance management for ophthalmologists. Something most ophthalmologists wouldn't have thought about. Uh, some some uh, webinars are about uh, honing talents and you know. Uh, kind of uh, renewing your hobbies in a more serious way. So I think there's also a burst of creativity uh, in uh, arranging webinars and finding newer topics to talk about, which probably we wouldn't have talked about otherwise, uh, if not for webinars. So uh, great uh, answers, everyone. So it's, it's uh, very heartening to see so many perspectives. So uh, my next question is for Dr. Chai. Mm, she is, uh, yeah, 
so uh, she is the head of the philippine network of young ophthalmologists and she has her own private practice uh, i remember i met you last at the global session in the oc uh, symposium so welcome back chai and uh, uh, i want to ask you how you have utilized social media or have you utilized social media as a teaching tool for young ophthalmologists uh, do you have any favorite handles or you prefer any particular kind of social media to kind of disseminate knowledge or information about ophthalmology in general hi thank you apurva um i would like to say hi to everyone here it's so nice to see everyone uh well with the pandemic suddenly the world isn't so big anymore so well nothing can replace face to face meetings to social me social beings like us so but i think in the middle of the pandemic social media has impacted our lives way beyond what we thought we thought it would it's been a silver lining and it's been the most convenient way to connect with everyone uh and it's also because uh strengthening connections with our trainees is important and we can't really connect just by just by texting and just by calling so uh social media is the closest way closest method to face to face so social media tools we have been using are of course zoom uh whose stocks have skyrocketed due to the pandemic and then we also i do i do facetime with my residents uh we do viber and then lately there's been cisco Web webex and of course uh google meet um educational sites we've been recommending now that we didn't pay too much attention to pre-pandemic uh were youtube because uh there we can see a lot of videos um brilliant videos from yossi um and then instagram uh the aao website of course um the alcon academy website i have no financial interest but it's very interesting to explore on that for those who don't know about it and then lately the aopcongress.com or the advanced ophthalmologic practice website so i i hope you guys can check that out because i've been recommending that lately and i think i've been getting good feedback out of those so there Hey, anything about the APO uh, social media handles? So you've been pretty involved with that. Yeah, for the PAO social media handles, um, because uh, the Philippine Network of Young Ophthalmologists have just been established last year. For the educational platform, we have our Instagram. Uh, please follow us. Um, we have uh, the Philippine uh, Pinoy Ophthalmologists. We have that on Instagram. As for Facebook. Um, it's a close group so it's just closed among the filipino young ophthalmologists and as for the youtube channel we have a youtube channel but um it doesn't have much education on it uh because as for the educational platform we have the we have our mother society for that so the philippine academy of ophthalmology for that so as for the young ophthalmologists we basically um focus on career building because the academic part is being handled by our mother society already thank you so much and uh, so next would like to know about any uh, unique situation or solution related to the pandemic that uh, you might have stumbled uh, upon just one that. thing yeah. divan sure. just one uh, thing about youtube i would like to add that a uh, lot of young ophthalmologists have started their own youtube channels and it's there's a mushrooming of youtube channels and all of them have been uploading their surgical videos and uh, talking about various surgical situations and it, they've got a lot of time on their hands to start like a full fledged youtube channel and kind of devote a lot of time to build it so uh, many of our young ophthalmologists are youtube stars now and i think you should i will will tell you about them and you can subscribe to their channels very good content very high quality content very high quality videos so youtube is uh, kind of uh, seeing a surge of uh, channels right now divakant great so next i invite dr zubeda uh, she is a vr consultant at the east avenue medical center and st luke's medical center in quezon city philippines 
and she is also the head of retina services at the Philippine Children's Medical Center. Uh, so, have you faced any unique uh, situation or solution during related to the residency training and education during the pandemic, which you would like to talk about? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Diva Khan, and to Yossi for inviting me to this session. And I'd also like to thank Cake and Pie Expo for providing this venue for YO educators to just talk and share the best practices of ophthalmic education. As I told the others, it's just like um, young educators um, talking in the library and sharing experiences. So um, what I'd like to share with you is the virtual clinic. So recently at our institution, we uh, set up the virtual clinic. Um, mainly this is for the medical interns and clerks. Um, because they need the virtual clinical exposure. Um, last year, we started, uh, upon uh, the start of the pandemic, we started immediately the e-learning curriculum for interns and clerks. However, we really found um, clinical exposure lacking because uh, they were pulled out of the hospitals. Um, so with the virtual clinic, um, it's very simple to set up. It's just a teaching scope, and then you have a phone adapter, and then you have the video conferencing platform. So through this, um, the, the students in the remote lo location will be able to see the findings on the slit lamp, the anterior segment and the posterior segment. And then there's another device that will be hooked up to the video conferencing platform wherein they'll be able to see the room view. So they'll be able to observe the history taking interview with the patient. And then they'll be also able to appreciate the visual acuity examination, including the other five point of logic exam. Um, so through this, and there, it's like they are in the clinic, but they are in their, they are located remotely where they are safe. And um, not only for intern centers, but this can also be utilized by the residents when they need to refer uh, patients to their consultants in real time. So um, they will be able to show the um, anterior segment findings and the posterior segment findings um, in real time to their consultants. Another thing that I'd like to share with you is the um, use of quiz maker apps or um, platforms wherein we can set up asynchronous quizzes or tests for the um, residents. So the pandemic created a very a unique situation wherein the regular schedule of rotations in subspecialty clinics are disrupted. And so the clinic schedule, the conferences, the evaluation of students are all affected. And in our institution, some of our of, um, residents are even asked to man or cover in, inter, in internal medicine wards where there are COVID uh, cases. So they are not able to attend to the rotations in ophthalmology department. So what's the good thing about this asynchronous quizzes is that it's a formative evaluation. At the end of the quiz, when they submit the quiz, um, they'll be able to receive the feedback. Um, they'll see the correct answers, the wrong answers. And then there's also a link for um, references that they can read. So even if they are in a rotation outside the center, the eye center, then they'll be still be able to continue with their learning. And uh, so this one way of making our curriculum pandemic proof. Um, so that's for the training. And another thing for fellows that we instituted is the retina in service examination. Um, this one, um, this is to um, make sure that the standard of um, education in the retina fellowship uh, programs are, um, are kept at par with international standards. So we have this retina in service exam uh, once a year, which we instituted last year. So those are the things that um, I'd like to share with you that I, I hope would also be helpful to the other YO educators. Wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, sharing with us, uh, Zubeda. Next, uh, we forgot to take uh, Dr. Jeremy's view uh, uh, as well. So. I would like to invite Dr. Jeremy Kwok for his views. He is an assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong and has special interests in eyelid orbital reconstructive surgery. Uh, so Dr. Jeremy, any your views on the online platforms and the online mode of education that uh, 
has picked up recently. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you um, Cake and Pie Expo for inviting me um, in Hong Kong, Young Ophthalmologist, to share our um, year of COVID and our online uh, training sessions. Um, basically, we also had a lot of webinars and I think um, a lot of uh, 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 doctors here have shared, um, you know, their good and bad. I feel that webinars are in generally uh, a good thing during COVID situation. I think um, it does enhance um, active participation. And for those who are slightly more shy, they can go to individual presenters after the presentation to um, ask their questions. Or I think the chat box is actually quite a good um, um, place to type what uh, what you want to ask. And, um, and also for, as people have said, recordings are good, but you never know if people will go back to watch the recordings. But I think in general, if you have a webinar you really want to review or you have forgotten some of the uh, things that are said, you can go back maybe prior to a um, surgical session that you're going to go to, you can review, say, maybe a younger resident, the, the, the FACO steps or the ECCE steps and how to you know, handle different surgical situations. Um, yeah, I think for us in Hong Kong, we had different webinars. And recently, we had a retinal workshop that was a two-day retinal workshop. We tried to liaise a, a younger ophthalmologist for presentation. And then we have some very senior um, who has been in private practice for many years, some um, uh, ophthalmologists. Probably my mass, my my teachers, teachers, teachers come in and join our discussions, and it was a, I think it was a good way to connect um, the different age groups uh, and also different senioritys um, within our locality. Um, so we had a very good discussion where it was. I think panel discussions are a very good way of sharing instead of giving a one-sided lecture. Um, having conversations um, with different uh, uh, ophthalmologists of different experience and specialties is, is very good. And uh, lastly, um, because in Hong Kong and like many other places, we have many different hospitals where uh, training and resident rounds occur um, at different times. I think our resident benefited a lot from going to different hospitals, um, webinars um, to have, uh, I think, a lot more teaching than what I had when we did not have any webinars at all. So I think the resources are out there. And uh, you can even pick your superstar to listen to. Uh, sometimes we have invited speakers from Canada or from the States to come share with us. And I think in general, it has connected the world uh, in a different way, uh, even though we are separated physically. And uh, I'm sure when the world open up, it opens up again, I think the friendships would have been strengthened in a way where um, it has been different before. And I think there are the good and the bads. And in general, I think we have adapted well. Ah, and lastly, I think it's very interesting because I think as the webinar goes, uh, has been going on for a while, initially there are a lot of technical difficulties in, in, in creating webinars. People were you know, doubtful into how Zoom works and there wasn't really a good platform for people to get on to share their, 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 um, their, uh, their webinars. But now everyone's using Zoom and you know, um, other webinars where everyone's so used to it and everyone has been upgrading their their you know the gadgets everyone has you know mics and like you know new headphones and everything so it's interesting to see how the world has changed um, with the new onset of a pandemic of webinars and i think it's an interesting change thank you wonderful points uh, jeremy uh, so Apova, let's uh, move on to the uh, surgical training segment uh, so the uh, the academic training and the theoretical aspect has been uh, beautifully covered by the Zoom and online uh, platforms, but surgical training has really taken a hit. So Apurva, let's start this segment. Uh, you are on mute, Apurva. Yeah. So coming to surgical training, my first question is to Dr. Hangda. Uh, how can one practice surgical skills when patients are less and there's uh, probably less conversion of OPD patients to uh, the surgical theater? Um, what has been, I know you're a vitreoretinal surgeon, what has been your experience in vitreoretinal surgeries, especially from the training point of view? Uh, yeah, thank you. So I think um, surgical training is one part that our uh, residents or fellows uh, fear the most during the pandemic. So, um, so it's very hard to replace the actual hands-on experience. But I think 
a lot of the fundamental um, ideas, fundamental concepts comes from uh, learning and uh, discussion, not from your own surgeries. So you'll never improve by doing a lot of surgery by yourself, but you will only improve by reading what others do and uh, by discussion with the senior doctors. So I think this is a very good time that we go back and to review the fundamentals. So um, I have some uh, specific uh, recommendations uh, for myself for um, the vitreo retinal surgeries. I think many, many of you might be familiar with uh, the vitreo retinal uh, surgery by Thomas Williamson. So that's a very nice uh, introduction to the basics of uh, vitreo retinal surgeries. As for cataract surgeries, uh, personally, I, I gained a lot of um, experience uh, from the uh, Eye Atlas, which is uh, from the uh, uh, group called the Eye Movies. So that uh, uh, offers a very good uh, video uh, introductions to all the basic uh, cataract um, uh, surgical uh, uh, maneuvers. So these two are my, uh, which build up my fundamental concepts of the uh, basic surgery. So I think this is a good time for all these um, on, on residents to uh, slowly and to learn how they can do better in the future. Um, another um, a possible um, um, a form of learning is to seize your chance during the emergency surgeries. So um, even during the lockdowns, the emergency surgery still goes on and um, the consultants, they will have some a bit of more leisure time to let you try. So um, I think this is a, a very good chance for the for the all, all those trainees. Uh, you can you can prepare beforehand, and when you show up in emergency surgeries, you can show that you're already very confident in managing these uh, more serious conditions. And your senior doctors will might let you to do more during these uh, leisure times. In the past, maybe um, because of the OR schedule, because maybe you have to do all these surgeries in the midnight, they don't want to uh, get, give you the chance to try this. But this is a good time if you're active and if you're prepared. I think you can go. Uh, you can have more experience in the emergency surgeries. And another um, thing you can try to uh, do is that even there's no surgeries. Uh, you can um, do a research on all the surgical cases or even a simple audit of all the, like say very, uh, for uh, many hospitals, they have a RD uh, register and uh, all these database. If you go and review it, you will find many interesting um, uh, stuff inside. So for example, uh, one of my, um, um, my, my colleagues, uh, she claimed that she had very rare cases of uh, recurrent retinal detachment. So um, I questioned her, but she, she don't believe it. But we go back during the uh, past one, uh, one or two months, we review our uh, database and found that uh, her recurrence rate is similar to the other doctors, which is not as low as she expected. So I think this is a good time that you go back and review all your cases and you'll find many interesting uh, uh, viewpoints from, from there. Um, and the last, last thing I like to say is that um, if the lockdown um, uh, continues to more than, uh, say, four to six months, I think uh, uh, if you are in a fellowship uh, stage, I highly recommend you that you, will, you should consider to extend your fellowship. Because um, although this might sound very, um, it's a very difficult uh, uh, decision, but uh, compared to your whole uh, career, this is only a very short time period. And the fellowship is very critical and very uh, crucial for your whole career. So um, just don't think too much about it, just extend. And uh, you'll definitely um, learn a lot uh, after the pandemics. So um, yeah, don't hurry and go to the next level because you will not perform well if you don't have the actual hands-on experience. So these are my um, uh, several opinions. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Honda. So uh, in India, uh, especially Divakant will agree with me because of the lockdown. Uh, 
patients that are coming after the lockdown have more severe membranes they have uh, diabetic membranes or even rds are coming with a lot more pvr than pre pandemic so residents and i mean not residents fellows are getting a lesser chances than uh, usual because you know this is a complicated case and the consultant would like to do it uh, himself or herself so is it similar in your place Uh, we haven't finished our first uh, semi lockdown, so it's hard to say. But uh, from your experience and from the experience from other countries, I think we should expect that to happen. So um, we are fortunate that for the current fellows, they are finishing up. They're they're at their uh, final uh, few months of their uh, fellowship. But for the new fellows, I think they will had a very hard time to start up with. Yeah. But anyway, um, at the begin beginning, um, it's good to uh, review more uh, fundamental concepts. So don't hurry to do all the uh, difficult cases. I think uh, slowly, slowly you'll get your chance and get uh, more uh, experience and you can uh, go and uh, uh, deal with all these uh, more complicated cases. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mace, your views? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I agree 100% with what, what Dr. Hang Ta uh, has just said. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about my personal experience because I, I just finished my board exams and I graduated residency just when the pandemic started. So I was alone in the clinic and I wanted to do as many surgeries as possible and I'm still in my learning curve as well. So it has been frustrating at the beginning when you say I want I have these plans, I would do this many cases, I'll tackle this and that, then I had to step back and I asked this question to Aika Ahmed, I had uh, um, the privilege to interview him and he said, take your time. Uh, review everything uh, in, in, in non-clinical setting, like know your machine, know your patient, uh, uh, um, know every bit, make it your friend, so that when you go into the OR again, that will be just behind you. You wouldn't be, you know, flustered in these things. So try to review the literature as many as much as possible. One more thing are surgical videos. Personally, I log in to cataractcoach.com like on daily basis <laughs> because uh, they do have real-time surgical videos. These are very important to watch real-time surgical videos, not the ones that are really quick and you'll be, because you'll be frustrated. They make it in like 10, 15 minutes and I take like 45 minutes to do this. And because it's not, they do have hurdles in the OR, they do have pitfalls, but when it's really heavily edited, that video, you're not gonna see these things. So try to go and see live videos unedited videos, those are gonna give you more, you know, realistic expectation to what is going on. And also see videos that are sent from residents where they have gone wrong and how to actually, um, um, you know, correct that. One more thing that is also good in the pandemic that people are actually, or mentors or more senior um, specialists have been offering their help a lot. Um, even if it is just theoretic, theoretical, not, on, not, not in the OR. Like you say, I have this problem. They have more time to talk to you, to chat about your technique, about what you do, about how to overcome this in the future. Also know your patients more. It gives you more time to know the patients, to actually evaluate the patient better and be patient yourself with yourself. You know, taking more time is of paramount importance. Just keep on telling yourself, we're going to get there. We're going to do that. Um, I'm going to make, do more surgeries uh, in the future. Um, I'm going to have more chances as well. But also remind yourself that you're going to have to work triple as hard when this all goes off because uh, you need to catch up a bit, let's say. Um, but also it's not that bad because you are going to be more prepared. You're going to have your base that is, you know, really solid and build up on that. And don't lose hope keep on a positive outlook to things. Um, our careers span most of our lives and um, we're gonna have time. It's not, a, it's not a contest with who did more surgeries or who's going to be the first because being the first is a thing. You are the first just one time, then 
other people are going to catch up. It's about consistency in your practice at the end. So um, you build up consistency by being patient, I guess. So um, that's it. You know, there are a lot of resources. A lot of people are going to help you uh, and be patient with yourself. Um, also, if you have a wet lab or a sim simulation, it's, it's really important to practice uh, on these things. You have access and privilege to these things. These are really, really of paramount importance in such times. Unfortunately, in Jordan, we don't have that, but um, I believe if your country offers these uh, um, facilities, uh, they're gonna help you a lot um, in honing your skill. So yeah, that's pretty much it. You're on mute, Apurva. Thank you, Maze. Very good points. Uh, excellent points. Divakant, next question shall we have? Yeah. Yes. So uh, Maze talked about a wet lab. So next question is uh, to uh, uh, Jeremy about a wet lab. So, uh, you know, how important it is in the present scenario and how we can enhance that experience? I think for me, when I was a uh, resident uh, training in like year one and two, I, we are, we already we had a wet lab. Um, I think the facilities were not as good as they were now. Um, in the past, we had like a retired phaco machine, and also like we suture on pig eyes, and um, we still use pig eyes nowadays because I think of the of the feel that is, is more real than maybe an artificial eye. Um, but I think nowadays uh, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, because our pandemic is not that out of control, so we still have some workshops that are for all the residents that are in our locality, in our city. So I think we, in the past, for lit surgery, have offered um, dissection of uh, with with sheep lamb heads, not not like not cadaver heads, because we couldn't really get access to those. So we had some lamb heads for lit surgery and orbital surgery and dissection. And then um, for vitro retinal surgery, I think there is a workshop that has a virtual. Um, not a virtual, but uh, um, like a 3D camera where people can um, use an artificial eye to uh, train their um, uh, vitro, uh, their vitrectomies. Um, and also for cataract, I think recently I tried to do the Yamane technique and I, I, I needed practice. So there are, some, um, there are some artificial eyes where you can buy just specific to train uh, the Yamane technique or, um, or the SFIOLs, which I think is very good. So all in all, I think a wet lapse is very important when you're trying like a new technique, um, uh, especially, uh, you know, when you're a resident, when especially during maybe the COVID situation where, you know, real time practice is harder. In, in our locality, we have um, decreased uh, our number of patients so we haven't completely locked down the hospitals um, yet. And uh, I think because the pandemic is, um, uh, is improving in our place. So our, 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 our number of cases um, are going back to normal in terms of our um, OPDs and our surgical practice. But I think uh, wet labs are very helpful. And I think there are a lot of new um, technologies that can be useful. Um, uh, yeah, and can be used. And I think it's, it's a good way to train um, if, if the pandemic is, is uh, creating a, a, you know, a, a, a problem for uh, the training, for training. Yeah. So thank you. Right. Yes, Akura, let's yes. move on to the next question. Yeah, yeah, we'll move on to the next question. So, uh, Dr. Ashraful, uh, can you tell us uh, your favorite online resources for enhancing surgical training? I know a lot of uh, the previous speakers have already said, uh, I told us, but what are your top online resources? Uh, thank you. That's a valid question and a time demanding question. But one thing I need to add with the other speakers that the previous and the recent pandemic, what we have, there is a must disadvantage of surgical training, hands on training. That is the main disadvantage for the fellows. Because before the pandemic in 2019, where my cataract and refractive fellows get 500 kids per year, but now it's 200 or 150 cases. It's very much frustrating for the fellows. That's the one point. But Things that there is no difference between the online teaching and online learning before pandemic and in the pandemic because what other fellow other speaker told that you must need to see the surgical steps from your seniors from your mentors to enhance yourself because doing surgery is one of the training but seeing the surgery is another part of the training. So the question answer is that what's the uh, what we have right now, the surgical 
training facilities which involves the online that we have previously with that also that our fellows and our trainees they must have to attend some surgical steps which were described by our faculties so step sometimes they have to attend live in the ward but sometimes we recorded the steps that is the i uh, not edited part the main live nearly live steps by step surgeries and we need to discuss with the fellows that and recently what we have incorporated that we have the zoom and internet facilities with all our uh, operation theater so what we are doing like that a senior faculty who cannot join in the or but as fellow is doing the surgery he or she can su supervise this surgery online from his chamber or where by internet this is a facilities we could incorporate it before the pandemic but we incorporated it right now and another thing is that the best thing for the pandemic we got a little bit more time so that our faculties this is the most regular time for the faculties that they will sit with the trainees online about the surgeries like i am the faculty of cataract and refractive so this is my weekly routine to sit with my trainees my fellows about all the steps the basic steps theories and fundamentals of these surgeries and what they are doing to supervise and also see their surgeries maybe i cannot go to the hospital all uh, six days but this is with online zoom or other um, uh, internet facilities we are supervising and we are discussing with them that is the thing that yes the fellows are not getting the that much of surgeries but their fundamental things and the steps they can learn by themselves and one thing i must thanks to dr honda that this was our views that definitely in this pandemic when the one year fellowship or 18 months fellowship if the fellows are not getting cases properly only the knowing everything is not enough you need to do at least some hands on training and you need to complete every steps of the critical situation to be confident so this is a good part i take on point that you can increase the duration of the fellowship if you think that the strains cannot get the proper cases thank you uh wonderful dr rashraful uh that's a very unique solution you found about relaying your surgeries online to a senior consultant that's a very good uh, solution so uh, dr zubeda have uh, have you stumbled upon any such solutions or unique situations during uh, especially pertaining to training and education um yeah regarding the what the others have already said dr rashraful and uh Uh, Dr. Jeremy, the silver lining really of the pandemic is that the consultants were able to slow down and really have time to discuss cases in depth. So I think the trainees, residents, and fellows should um, make the most of that time that the consultants are able to give them. Um, they should also read on their own so that when the consultants are there, they will have a very um, um, very good discussion um not just a one sided discussion so uh, they should be proactive in their learning um second is that um here in the philippines uh, the vitreo retina society of the philippines have a regular fellows forum so as dr ashrafo said um a case that is discussed among a group of people a lot of people learn from that learn from that um case so um here We, the case that is seen in one um, one institution can be uh, shared with the other institution such that learning is multiplied and uh, the others also learn from the case seen in um supposed to be in other institutions um but what i want to share is that the about the rover system e-mobile app so we uh, stumbled upon this because um During the pandemic, uh, there's a limit to the number of people that can be inside the operating room theater. So it's just the surgeon, which is the trainee or the fellows or the resident, and the assist, which is the consultant. And the other consultants have to be in a remote location to be able to see the real-time uh, surgery. Uh, we need to have an app that would allow them to see the real-time surgery. Um, so we have this Rover Systems e-mobile app. 
if you have a camera in your microscope, um, a digital video recorder, and you hook it up to the internet connection, um, you can view the video real time, or you can do a playback or download the video. So during the surgery, the consultants can discuss um, what is going on in the surgery. And also at the same time, if uh, uh, during a conference maybe, the videos can also be played so that the case can be discussed thoroughly. Uh, this can also be used uh, for medical students because um, they learn from the didactic uh, lectures. However, they appreciate to when they see the surgeries itself. Um, they are not, right now, during the pandemic, they're not allowed to be inside the operating room. So um, the video, the surgical videos really help for them to grasp the, um, the better understanding of what we discuss in the lectures for medical interns and clerks. So that's what I wanted to share. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zubeda. I think uh, your answer uh, had many common things with Dr. Ashraful's answer as well. Please, could you leave uh, the name of the app in the chat box? So, yeah. So my next question is for Dr. Sonal. Uh, this is a very important question. Did you notice any major gaps in knowledge or practice patterns amongst residents or fellows when there was some respite and they came back to the uh, ward and the OR? Were there any major knowledge gaps or practice gaps? Thank you, Apu. Dr. This is a really important question. So um, yes, um, uh, so our setup was is was such that uh, we were uh, lucky enough to have a, a small satellite or peripheral hospital attached to the main medical college hospital for the eye department. That hospital, main hospital, was converted to a COVID center, and we were all forced to go in a way and work at the satellite center. And a lot of residents were working in the COVID. Uh, so they were uh, for a very brief amount of time in the eye center, which was having much lesser resources in terms of the equipment uh, as compared to the main center that was converted to a COVID uh, center. So when they came back and the uh, like the original building was uh, was sort of uh, you know taken back by the high department, that was also a very very happy moment. We were going back to the whole, whole parent hospital, and uh, that uh, uh, that time onwards, uh, we as consultants were not uh, feeling that different going back to the OR. I wouldn't say that it was not uh, not like ex a good experience to go back, but for the residents, I felt that yes, uh, they had even you know those who were first year residents and had just learned the uh, you know uh, the slit lamp uh, you know viewing systems and you know had just set their IPDs in the uh, microscopes. They were all now having to relearn all those steps and they, their their hands were so hesitant in doing those uh, simple procedures just after a gap of say one or two months and uh, it was it was a real uh, real learning and hesitant uh, you know uh, phase for them initially for a few days but yes i also noticed that they had this renewed spark of interest and respect for the resources like earlier uh, we would tell them go and uh, perform this oct angiography and come back and was like okay we have to do 10 we'll go and do and now when they had been shifted to a hospital that did not have the OCT angiography, but just had a basic OR setup. Now, when they were back, they had this renewed, uh, you know, interest and also a sort of a ticking time bomb kind of an effect that when will this all be taken away and let's, you know, learn as much as possible, as quickly as possible. They were more aggressive towards the number of surgeries that they wanted. And uh, I, I could see that, uh, yes, the interest was really renewed and they were really grateful for the branch and the patients and whatever opportunities that they were getting. Uh, they were like, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, very, very, uh, very much uh, eager to, uh, much more eager to learn in the brief period that now they were getting because uh, we were, we could all see that, yeah, some more patients of COVID and something might come up very soon. And being in the medical college setup, they would also have to go back to their COVID duties pretty soon. So those, the, those period, yes, it did see, I, I could see that uh, some of the skills were getting sort of, you know, uh, uh, diminished or shaky or, you know, like um, a, a hesitancy had come in, but then it all started uh, going uh, back to normal. And uh, uh, we also ourselves on the teaching side, we tried our best to give them more number of cases and to sort of make up for the lost time. 
so it was uh, it was a period in which uh, yes uh, the offline classes also saw very much renewed uh, interest and during uh, all sorts of uh, other uh, practical teaching also i i felt that the residents did have a, a really a really really uh, quick uh, way of uh, learning because of their uh, attitude which was now having more of uh, i should say gratitude and more of uh, uh, interest towards their branch and uh, it was like uh, this was taken away from us for a while and uh, uh, like let's maximize whatever time that we have so that thing was something really appreciable uh, i i felt for me so yes there were things that were uh, that were lost and but when they came back for whatever brief period that it was uh, it was a, a very very good comeback i should say so mm. thank you Purva, for so, this question a renewed interest and more gratitude so dr chai your views Chai, you're muted. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, mm. sorry. Well, you were asking about uh, if there's uh, like the major gaps in the knowledge and practice patterns, right? right. So, uh, among my residents, well, it has definitely been compromised because I think the normal stresses of personal and professional lives have been compounded with the fears and anxieties of the pandemic. So. I have seen an initial decline in their academic performance. And then I figured that the learning curves are much steeper uh, with less face-to-face -face interactions and then less cases. And then of course there are less surgeries because we've been cutting back on surgeries. I expected more post-op complications, but surprisingly, uh, maybe my residents are more vigilant in learning from every case. And maybe because they know that there are technically less patients to learn from. So uh, I think they've been more vigilant in learning from what they have and making do with what they have with the limited um, patients that they have. So um, it is impossible to predict when we will all be free to restart the routine care. But we keep on reminding our residents that despite COVID, they are still under training. And then they are still ophthalmologists, and there is so much there out there to be to learn. So as consultants, we are learning with them as well. But I am confident that everyone is getting the hang of things, and we are all thriving together every day. So even if even if I thought that you know it's compromised, their their learning is compromised. I think my residents are pretty are handling it pretty well because they're. It's like they're more conscious about and they respect, they're respectful of what they have, of whatever it is they have left. So that's it. Thank you, Chai. Uh, there was a lot of uh, agreement with Dr. Sonal's answer as well. So my last question in this session is for Dr. Chi Wai. Uh, how was your experience in COVID wards as an ophthalmologist? Hi. So I was actually personally deployed to a screening facility to screen uh, symptomatic patients for COVID-19. And we were seeing about 100 patients a day. Almost all of these patients actually had to uh, receive nasal swaps for uh, uh, PCR. And about 90% of these swaps turned out to be positive for COVID. So at that time, there was actually a lot of uh, anxiety and fear among us. Uh, in terms of whether we will actually uh, uh, catch COVID-19 ourselves. But uh, I guess our infectious control procedures were quite rigorous and we, we were safe. And interestingly, uh, at that time, uh, none of these patients actually had any sort of eye symptoms. So later on, we, we were still interested to find out whether there were some uh, subclinical signs that we could find on retinal imaging. So we were at a quarantine facility. We did a retinal imaging study, about 100 patients with uh, COVID-19. And about one in nine of them actually had some retinal mi microvascular signs, uh, such as dot hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, or, or some have even have vascular tortuosity. And these are patients with no history of cardiovascular disease. So we thought that this could be transient retinopathy from cardiovascular alterations uh, or seen in COVID-19, or it could just be a manifestation of some form of systemic inflammation. Uh, in terms of uh, perhaps indirectly how COVID-19 has uh, impacted some of the uh, incidence of disease that we see, 
uh, would be that we saw actually saw a slight spike in the rates of uh, endophthalmitis after intravitreal injections. And at the time, there were some reports also coming out of this increased uh, incidence of endophthalmitis. And it was postulated that uh, this was because patients were wearing face masks and uh, respiratory droplets were actually inadvertently uh, directed towards the eyes during, during the intravitreal injection. So this led us to change our practice whereby uh, patients still had to wear masks, but we made sure to tape this mask down, uh, make sure they were airtight to prevent any possibility of these respiratory drops from reaching the eye during uh, intravitreal injections. So this was one of the interesting um, sort of increase in uh, rates of infection that we in the eye that we saw during COVID-19 uh, pandemic sometime last year. Uh, so far, I think we have got it quite well controlled now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, as a continuation of that question, Dr. Zubeda, uh, how was the triad system in your hospital for ophthalmic checkups, considering it's more of an elective speciality? Well, first of all, it's really very important that for an institution to have safety officers. So in our eye center, we have a group of safety officers composed of doc uh, doctors, nurses, and the uh, Chief President, um, the group of safety officers, they overlook the adherence to protocols, review the safety protocols, and they also oversee and uh, coordinate the contact tracing so that there will be an immediate response when a case is identified. Um, second, the appointment system is very important. This will avoid crowding in waiting areas, and uh, we can limit the number of patients coming in in a particular time. Um, third is that uh, we have a triage officer um, that interviews the patients coming in. Um, they have a health declaration form to make check the symptoms and the exposure of the um, patients and the caregivers that are going into the eye facility. Um, also, we have a red eye triaging system. So the it is not very common to have conjunctivitis, but it's a uh, um, for patients with COVID, but it is a manifestation of COVID. So we have had several experiences with that. So we set up this red eye triaging system. So if a patient has red eye, they are immediately sent to the red eye triage, um, evaluated if the patient um, is at high risk for COVID infection, and they will be sent to the um, COVID emergency room right away. If not, they'll be sent, uh, they're allowed to go into the facility and evaluated further. Um, but uh, the last thing is that we are very heavily rely, relying on testing. So we use RT-PCR and antigen testing uh, for patients that will undergo procedure and also for patients that we think are at risk for um, COVID exposure, uh, COVID infection. So those are, uh, so far, we are able to control um, the COVID exposure and COVID infections in our eye institute. And we are able to keep our staff the patient uh, safe, um, um, provide a safe environment for for the uh, everybody. Okay, thank you, Zubeda. Uh, Divakan? Yes. Uh, so next, uh, my question to Che: uh, Did you use an eye of a patient with the pandemic? Oh my goodness! Yes. Um, I lost an eye and a life during the pandemic. And then because during the first parts of the first few weeks of the lockdown in March 2020, I was so scared to go out. So I canceled my clinics and then I refused to hold face-to-face -face clinics. So I tried to push online consultations, but as a private practitioner, the private patients thought it was free. So, and then a lot were uncomfortable with it. So I finally decided to retrofit my clinic put all the air purifiers and exhaust fans and vents. And then on my first clinic day, my patient with orbital lymphoma came with more extensive lymphoma and then he had no vision anymore. So when I asked why didn't he call me or tell me about it, he said, because doctor, you didn't have clinic. So, and then I had a retinoblastoma kid with recurrent retinoblastoma who, felt, who failed to undergo treatment. Again, when I asked why, they answered because of the lockdown. So because there wasn't public transport. So since then, the words 
I didn't I didn't have clinic and then lockdown, lockdown, lockdown kept on resonating in my head. So because of that, I vowed never to miss clinic again, despite periodic lockdowns, despite surges in COVID cases here in my country, because we had we have them every now and then. Uh, it's like a vicious cycle. Uh, so even if we have those, I don't miss my clinic anymore. But I think it's because I've retrofitted my clinic already. And I think a lot of doctors have done that because our parent society has given out recommendations uh, to how to retrofit our clinics and to make it safer for everyone. There. Such a difficult situation for uh, physicians in general. Uh, Apoorva, the next question, please. Yes, uh, so can you, uh, I think uh, uh, Divakant, we've already had a social media question. I think we can skip that. Isn't it? Uh, this is in terms of, uh, you know, utilizing social media for your practice. Okay. Dr. Jeremy, things. your thoughts? Maybe we can have a quick comment. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Jeremy? Uh, I think we've been using a lot of um, WhatsApp since WhatsApp has been around. Like for the residents, when they see a case or a CT that they've done, they want like secondary um, consultation for, say, a specific orcoplastic situation. Then um, they will usually send uh, it through WhatsApp uh, a video of, um, you know, the CT scan or um, whatever they are struggling with to uh, more senior ophthalmologists. And then we don't really have to uh, return as much. Um, secondly, we, uh, in terms of show, show media is less so because I think there is um, more of a um, of a patient confidentiality. So usually we would not post it anything on uh, you know like uh, Facebook or WhatsApp. I mean Facebook or or um, Instagram. But I think we have started say um, for some of our prison consultations because in our practice um, in our hospital we do see some patients who are inmates in in the in the prison. Um, we're trying to set up um, a connection between um, the hospital system with. With the, and also with the in, inside prison clinic so that we can, uh, um, we can see the notes. Um, and whenever the patient needs an OCT or something, it can be seen within the prison and the patient doesn't have to come out. Um, and also uh, we try to do some telemedicine with um, new slit lamps and, and things um, within the prison. So that is, is uh, I think, um, something new we're trying to test first. We haven't really done it with um, patients who are, we actively have in the hospital currently, but because uh, of the prison consultations, we don't have to go in so frequently now, then um, those are things that we have adapted to uh, with a um, COVID in mind or also with some kind of um, uh, limitations in, uh, in, in, in breaking some barriers of going into prison, et cetera. So this is some things we have changed. Um, yeah, apart from that, I think uh, for consultation, usually it's just through uh, uh, WhatsApp to, to try to, uh, yeah, for, for, for help kind of thing, yeah. Okay, okay. Right, Divakant? Yeah, uh, so next question is for Dr. Ashrafal. So this is in terms of uh, somebody having a private practice or having his own setup. Uh, so it has really affected uh, people who have started out fresh and I, I think all the practices have had a great impact due to this. So do you have any tips on how to come out of this situation and come out stronger? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Divakant. Because uh, in this COVID situation, we all face these though we are who are doing the private practice. So I can share my story is that one thing is that you have private chamber only. And second thing is you own the hospital. The second impact is very big. When you have the hospital like us, we do the group practice and we have nine branches. And when the COVID pandemic started, it really impacted us because we closed our hospital for 15 days and 15 days for nine hospitals, it's a huge financial thing. But one thing is that, that you need to make some structures that what is the thing? In this time, when people are afraid to go out, to come to the hospital, you need to email, you need to communicate with your old patients who had get service from you previous days that yes, what service are now we are offering that you can come when you need to our hospital, we are safe, we are maintaining all the precautions, everything we are maintaining that we need to encourage and make them feel safe to come to the hospital. And again, we need to spread the things to the local community that yes, this hospital is open because in this pandemic, what happened in lockdown, so some uh, eye 
all time is not emergency. And when the chamber practice is going, all the doctors are sitting in the chamber. But you need to spread the news in the local community that yes, your hospital is chamber is open. That is one tip. And second tip is that when it's come to the hospital, you need to make sure that your major stakeholders, your major surgeons, like who has bulk of patients, they must need to do the chamber. It's very tough, but you make to come to a situation that they continue their chamber. I was affected in COVID two times, but I could not stop my chamber. Similarly, the other practitioners and definitely the surgery, you cannot stop the surgery. Surgery facilities must have to continue with all the precaution because the surgery is the main revenue for the hospital. So for who are doing the private practice, the thing is that good service and Definitely awareness among the patients that you're giving the service and patient has the faith that yes, they can get the best service when they come to you. That is the main tips to recover from this situation. Thank you. Fantastic points, uh, Dr. Ashraful. Uh, Dr. Divakant, would you like to ask the next question? Uh, so my next uh, question is Chief. So how has been used during the lockdown, the pandemic? How have you been able to utilize this time? Ah, hi. Okay, so um, with regards to research, I think it was it was a double-edged sword because if you already had the data and you're just writing up, uh, definitely that gave you a lot of time for you to. Uh, finish our manuscript and get it published. But if you are still recruiting patients, still gathering data, then basically that aspect uh, grinded to a halt during the lockdown. Uh, uh, now it's, it's better now, we are getting more patients, but it, during those times, patients were not keen to sign up for studies. They didn't want to spend uh, extra time in the hospitals, uh, basically worried about infection. So um, with regards specifically to COVID-related literature, uh, just now I mentioned that we did a study uh, which we were able to very quickly carry out in a quarantine facility uh, describing the retinal signs in COVID-19 patients. And I think uh, that experience taught me that the key to conducting COVID research or any future research that involves a, a outbreak, disease outbreak, is really that you will need quite uh, to closely coordinate with infectious disease experts as well as the ground staff so that you can ensure safety of your safe, your study team members, uh, make sure that you have proper transfer and handover equipment so that infectious disease protocols can be closely adhered to. Uh, image acquisition had to be fast to minimize patient contact and data should be uploaded to the cloud to avoid uh, unnecessary transfer and potential contamination of hard copy data files. And we also explore the use of uh, e-consent, so we don't use physical consent forms. And, and I think ideally in a disease outbreak situation, this should be done on electronic forms. Uh, if, if you are interested, you can look at uh, our study, which has been published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, the other things, uh, the other COVID-related studies, I think, are of interest is that uh, we got together some YOs from the region to complete a survey on how the pandemic has uh, impacted their training. And basically the survey has confirmed what we uh, fear that uh, training has indeed been quite severely impacted. And this, this manuscript is still under review, but I hope that it will be published soon. Uh, I think a few of us here are co-authors on this paper. So thank you so much for helping to gather the responses from your YOs. Thank you. That's very interesting, Dr. Chi Wai. Uh, the last question is uh, to Hangda and Mace. So Hangda, did you uh, renew anything in your personal repertoire of uh, hobbies or talents? Were you able to devote more time to your personal kind of uh, hobbies? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. So uh, you see, I'm an outdoor person. So my uh, previous exercise focused on uh, like, so for ma marathons and uh, triathlons, mountain climbings, this sort of stuff. So it never occurred to me that uh, I will be doing yoga in my house. So um, yeah, so during the past few months, 
I have taken up uh, many uh, online yoga uh, courses and I found it to be extremely um, helpful. So um, it, does, it not only just uh, train your core uh, muscles, but it also uh, calm down your mind and it also improve your posture. So after practicing yoga, so I, I'm more aware of my daily posture and uh, I have paid more attention to my posture during the surgery. So if you take a walk around the operation room, you'll find uh, most of the ophthalmologists, their posture during the surgery is very bad. It's bad for your neck, bad for your back, and bad for your uh, thighs. So um, after doing uh, practicing yoga, I think I adjust all my postures during clinics and operations, and I have less uh, stress neck and uh, uh, muscle aches uh, uh, from uh, uh, in a daily basis. So I think it's very helpful. And uh, there are many good applications online. So uh, you can uh, just use your phone and do yoga uh, at any time at your own house. Okay. And yeah, so I think this is a very good um, exercise for uh, the COVID uh, pandemic era. Yeah. I think yoga is one favorite activity for a lot of people during the pandemic. Uh, Mace, what are your thoughts? Well, I believe um, during the pandemic, all we wanted to do is just try to keep ourselves centered and sane and um, try to find a bit of serenity in amidst all the chaos that was going on. So um, I found myself also reading more, uh, catching up on my fictional reading, uh, other than Talmud reading, um, as well as exercising. I found out that I really like to do a lot of deadlifts, so I've been increasing my weights. And um, one more thing that I turned our basement at home to a painting room, and uh, I started painting. I'm not that good at it, but it just gives you some catharsis and g keeps you centered and takes your mind off stuff. When you try I to learn painting about behind you, is that yours? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> show us. Yeah, it's not that great, but yeah, whatever. Just no, you know, show us. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's pretty much it. You know, just try to learn something that takes your mind off stuff. And I believe that's a redundant answer that everybody is trying to do. You know, to keep ourselves centered and sane and take our minds off stuff. So yeah, and having time is good sometimes. So. Yeah, that's what I probably did most of the time. That's great. Wonderful. That's great. So, uh, so the organizers have uh, found our session really interactive and interesting. So they have given us a couple of minutes more to interact. So, so any more comments from anybody? It's an open house. Anybody wants to give a comment uh, before we close the session? I, I think I had no step in. I've been kind of listening to everybody. That's why I told Devakant. I said, you know, I'm not going to speak much. We just want to hear from everybody what's happening. And Sonal's given our points of view from the India perspective. But I think, you know, all of us are kind of going through a very similar situation in, in what we are uh, you know, looking at. And we learn a lot from each other's experiences. I think, you know, like we were discussing yoga at the end, yoga is definitely something that's helped me a lot in most of my, you know, busy schedules. I can imagine I'd be having all kinds of issues of cervical spondylosis and this and that if it were not for yoga. So definitely that's something I recommend everybody do. And, uh, you know, more so, uh, you know, we're all adapting to this new normal. And, uh, you know, very, uh, probably, you know, now our pace of adaptation is a lot higher. So, uh, we should support each other and I think we're doing a good job there, all of us, and uh, it's great to hear from all of you. Any last comments, Dr. Son, before we close the session? Well, I think it was a, a very healthy and interesting discussion and it was uh, extremely heartening, I should say, to uh, hear from people across the globe having similar experiences, maybe, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Che pointed out, that even she felt that some of her residents were, uh, you know, having a renewed uh, or greater respect for the human material that they are learning on and uh, the variety of um, experiences that people have shared in terms of their own uh, refocus towards their personal uh, goals and, and life in general uh, and uh, the stresses that have affected all of us and yet um, sort of uh, brought us together on this uh, online platform, all these discussions have have you know brought us closer despite being far apart from us uh, this has been uh, you know uh, something as a shared experience learning that everybody has been feeling the same thing it, you know sort of builds your kinship in a way 
uh, it, it you know uh, binds you despite being uh, so far apart from each other i think some of you might agree um, any comments from uh, jubeda or uh, jeremy so uh, i think yeah uh, you go ahead jeremy Oh, no, thank you. I just want to thank everyone. It's great to um, hear about everyone's um, uh, year of uh, webinars, COVID, and, um, and their contribution to their society. So thank you for, you know, having this and knowing that, you know, exercise is, is, is great. And um, yeah, I've been doing a little bit of sailing in my locality because there's some, there's a bit of ocean and it's pretty, it's uh, pretty. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Yeah, so I, so I, I think um, to follow that up, I think the pandemic is a, the great equalizer. So even if you come from a first world country or a third world country, developing country like the Philippines, we go through the same challenges. And um, I think those commonalities bring us closer. And this venue, like opportunities to be together, help us uh, to share, uh, to learn from each other, and so move forward beyond the pandemic. So hopefully we'll, uh, the pandemic will end soon, but um, in the meantime, um, let's all um, go through it together so that um, we'll be stronger. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Ashraf, uh, just, your last comments. We'll, yeah. we'll take comments, last yeah. comments from everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vivekan. Thank you, Dr. Digvijay and Yoshi for this excellent session. So we got lots of take-home points and hopefully we will utilize some points to our home also. And definitely we are looking forward to end the pandemic and meet with all. But till then, online is the best resource and we will continue that. Thank you very much. So the interesting thing is that Apart from Chivai, I don't think I have met any of you personally. Um, but still, all of you, uh, everybody is so familiar. So that's how the pandemic has brought all of us closer. So Chivai, your comments? Yeah, I think, uh, well, thank you again for inviting me. And uh, I've heard so many interesting viewpoints from everyone today. Uh, I think these conversations are very important and uh, they will definitely help us to emerge from this pandemic uh, even stronger than before. Uh, that's, that's what I hope for the future of ophthalmology. Thank you. Uh, Mace, anything, last comments? So I just wanna thank you all for this. Uh, I wanna thank Divakant for being really power horse in all this, these times for young ophthalmologists. When we started Yojo, um, uh, they were so generous, the OC, to give us teaching sessions and they're always including people from all over the world. And I believe the power of giving is, is, is really great and we have to um, adapt that um, and try to be open. And that's what our, the pandemic has also um, taught us, to be open to chances to seize the opportunities and not just to wait it out uh, because waiting it out doesn't work. Uh, we have to work within uh, the pandemic as much as possible. And yeah, sometimes make the best of it. Sometimes just wait a bit and things are going to be better at the end. So thank you very much. And I hope everybody would have a good day today um, for the rest of their day. We're starting here in Jordan. So um, and see you all in person soon, probably. Who else is left? Chief? Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. You know, the, the challenges of the pandemic, it's so, it's so easy to get lost in the noise of the challenges of this pandemic. And, you know, having this group and your leadership, uh, inspiring each, uh, each other to do, to just keep on making it better for everyone, it's, it's, it's very centering. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I really hope we can see each other soon. And last, Honda, yeah. So one thing, can I just ah. say one thing, Devakant? Sure, sure, sure. Oh, thank you. So sorry for the introduction. So we should have a good clap for Dr. Devakant and Yoshi before this ending of the session. Because the one thing is that the COVID is pandemic and I think Dr. Devakant and Yoshi, they are the pandemic for the young ophthalmologists. 
So that's the good part. They, they are to opposite. And the good part for them, the young ophthalmologists, the grown up in the pandemic, early, they took the leadership and the great part. So it's a very thank you. Thank you. It's a good time to acknowledge the team effort and the leadership that we have in the form of Dr. Dick Vijay, Dr. Apurva, and our next president, Dr. Sonal. So hopefully greater times ahead in front of us. And Dr. Honda, your last comments, and then Apurva, we can close the session. Uh, yes. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Eva Kent. Uh, the only person I've met in person is Chiwai. But yet, everyone seems so familiar. So uh, thank you all for the great discussion and thank you for hosting this uh, nice, uh, excellent event. Thank you all. Yes, I said so a special thanks to you, uh, Divakant and Apurva for you know moderating the session so beautifully, so seamlessly. It was absolutely nice. It was mesmerizing to listen one thought and another and another and it was amazing. And a thanks to all the panelists and all the attendees who are attending this session, to Cake and Pie Expo, the Media Mice, the organizers for giving us this opportunity you know, we'll, I hope we continue to work together in the future, all the young ophthalmology societies, all of us as uh, leaders, as friends, you know, and we make this grow further our network. And uh, again, a special thanks to Devakant and Apurva for putting this together. Wonderful. Apurva, your comments, and then we'll have a good uh, group photograph and we'll close the session. No, I mean, no final comments, really. I just think we all had a great time uh, spending more time with our families. I know uh, Divakant had a baby recently. I I have a toddler now, 18 months old. And I think Che is a mother to two toddlers herself, she told us last time. So I think we got a lot of time to kind of spend with our children, which we wouldn't have if we were working full time. So, yeah. Uh, that's it. Let's have a group. It is really that. appreciable that despite these toddlers, Devakant and you have done such a phenomenal job at uh, making this session and other sessions uh, a, a great success. <laughs> let's, let's have a group. group let's have a your group. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you all at our show and uh, the recording will be available 48 hours after the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.